Hello, and thank you so much for joining me for my talk on bending through grief, the healing power of cognitive flexibility. I'm Desiree Sharp, and I am the program coordinator for the UGA Torrance Center, and it's truly a privilege to be a part of the 2022 Festival of Ideas. So let me share my screen with all of you and we'll get started with my talk today and I'll be here for the Q&A after my presentation. So I can't wait to engage with all of you and share really wonderful ideas throughout this festival. All right, so let's begin. All right, many of you have probably seen this image throughout your life or maybe after you suffered a great loss and it is an image of a ceramic bowl that has been beautifully repaired after breaking with what is called golden joinery or kintsugi. Now, I suffered a deeply tragic loss in my life. And a lot of people sent me images describing this concept to me. And it wasn't obviously about the practical act of kintsugi, which is making something beautiful after breaking. It's about the philosophical idea that an object's story isn't just about when it did well, when it didn't break. And in fact, the breakage and the repair is a truly important part of any given object story. So this idea that we break and we heal and we might even become more beautiful after healing finally resonates with me now. And I show it because it is something that I think initially a lot of people in the early stages of grief are really almost repulsed by because the idea that you could be even more beautiful after losing something extremely precious to you is sort of difficult to accept and might even make people angry. But now I completely understand and hopefully I'll walk you through how I've come to be in this position of really loving this idea of Kintsugi. So what is grief? Well, Grief is obviously not a new idea to humans and it's an ancient emotion and it's something that many non-human animals even feel, but it's actually really complicated to describe because you hear many terms, you know, sadness, depression, bereavement, um, you know, the list goes on really. And the bottom line is that it's an experience that you will go through your entire life. And in fact, many people kind of identify that to be human, to be alive is to also grieve. So we often want to compartmentalize this feeling because it shakes our world. It makes it seem like perhaps the meaning we had built for ourselves or identified in our lives is maybe lessened or totally gone after we suffer a deep loss. But in fact, if you think of it as this cycle, a journey, a spiral that changes and continues throughout your whole life, then you sort of start to see it more as a shift in identity. 
And that ownership can be extremely helpful, but we'll talk about how you get there a little later on. But I wanted to first start with this really important information that people didn't really distinguish between types of grief, sadness, depression, et cetera, until Sigmund Freud in a very methodical way, or at least in an analytical way. So in 1917, Freud published Trauer und Melancholie, and it was translated into English in 1918 to Mourning and Melancholia. And you, many of you have probably heard this before, but Freud said, in mourning, it is the world which has become poor and empty. In melancholia, it is the ego itself. So he was saying, mourning is when you lose something outside of yourself and the pain, the emotional pain and often physical pain from psychosomatic processes that you experience is from the outside. Whereas melancholia is much more about oneself and is a lot fuzzier. There's not an identifiable situation often that makes people melancholy. So we will be focusing on mourning in this presentation today. So I also wanted to give a shout out to these words that Freud has to say about melancholy. We find a place for what we lose. Although we know that after such a loss, the acute stage of mourning will subside, we also know that we will remain inconsolable and will never find a substitute. No matter what may fill the gap, even if it be filled completely, it nevertheless remains something else. And I thought that paired extremely well with Kintsugi, even though Freud was sort of identified as this, you know, pretty depressed guy and there was always this grayness to everything he had to say. He actually here doesn't say that the something else that we become or that our story becomes is not beautiful. So because of, we know of Freud, we kind of say, yeah, okay, he's sort of saying nothing's ever gonna be the same again in a negative way, but he doesn't actually say that, which is why, again, I really like how, how this pairs with the idea of Kintsugi. Let's talk about this lady, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who is really awesome and often gets kind of slammed by modern grief researchers and not for unfounded reasons. She really didn't have an empirical approach to the way she studied grief. Um, she, however, you know, had, has a model that is the most popular, by far the most popular model of the five stages of grief, which most of you have probably heard about. But I just wanted to point out that, you know, she was extremely influential in how people took hold of their grief. So she wrote a book in 1969 on death and dying in which she outlined this grief cycle. So some people, again, have critiqued her for saying, oh, once you get through the stages of grief, you're done and you're okay. But she didn't necessarily say that. However, you begin with denial where it's just unbelievable that this has happened and then maybe move to anger that you're totally lacking in any sense of control over what has happened to the person or people that you love to yourself. And then you start trying to bargain. And in my own personal loss, this stage was really comical in some ways because I knew that it was impossible to change the situation yet. I kept thinking, what would I give up? What would I trade into somebody? for this to not be happening or for me to have one more hour with this person even. 
And then of course, there's all sorts of different experiences of depression. And part of that can be running away from your life or often addiction enters here. And then eventually acceptance. So you get to a point where you say, okay, this has happened. And how am I going to live in my life now? And I've said this to people so many times over that when presented with a really extreme loss, I got to a point where I realized I really only had two options. And one was to kind of hook into this pain, unfairness, and spread that light on everything that I saw in the world and in my own personal life, or to actually be cooler than I ever had been, to, to grow was part of the choice that I realized I had to make if I wanted to continue to have a beautiful life. Um, I also wanted to point out that these ideas that Kubler-Ross proposed kind of slotted her in a Time article that talked about the 100 most influential thinkers of the 20th century. And again, I just wanted to kind of elevate her in this talk because I do think that we often do this and Freud as well, where we kind of dismiss a lot of what they say because they weren't approaching things empirically, but they really were great thinkers and I would like to pay homage to that. All right, let's shift gears a little bit. Let's get into some stories. And the first story I want to tell you is about a nightclub called the Coconut Grove Lounge. And this was a really happening nightclub in Boston. And it was Thanksgiving break in 1942. And on this particular November day, November 28th, the club was packed. It was maxed out capacity wise. In fact, it was double capacity. And the reason why this, the owner Barnett, Barney Lansky could get away with this is he really had some ties with the mafia and he sort of, you know, was rubbing elbows with people to the, you know, at the police force, the mayor, everyone kind of knew this guy, Barney, and sort of let him do whatever he wanted. Now, he also happened to have the emergency doors locked during this time, most of them, because a lot of people would try to sneak in, especially when it was super busy and they just wanted to get in without paying a cover or maybe they were underage. So they try to sneak in. So he said, no, 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 I'm going to lock these doors. And, you know, everyone in town is like, okay, let's let Barney do that. That's fine. Additionally, this is during wartime, right? So a lot of typical resources that businesses would have were being sent out and they were having to have replacement things. For example, in many air conditioning systems, they replaced Freon with uh, methyl chloride. And methyl chloride happens to be highly flammable. So imagine this night, November 28th, 1942, and the place is packed. It's everyone's having a great time, music's going, bodies, you know, squished in there, and an electrical fire breaks out. So a few shorts lights the methyl chloride on fire, and people are trapped in this building. So many people were stuck inside. A few got out but 492 people died that night in Boston. 
and the place was a wreck. It was a huge tragedy. It's the second uh, most fatal single building fire in America still. So this was a really big deal and it really rocked Boston. And we enter this lovely man, Eric Lindemann, 1944, starts working with, you know, really hundreds of patients who had lost people to this fire. And he begins the first truly systematic research of grief. So he was the chief of psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. And still today, uh, grief researchers identify him as being the first one who really did, you know, data-driven work that still continues along the lines of what people are looking at today. So he, he looked at it um, from a lot of different angles, but I wanted to point out the, you know, really some of the coolest stuff he did, which was called grief work. And it's actually about healing. It's not necessarily about, you know, the work he's doing or other researchers are doing. It's about the people who are experiencing grief. And he identified kind of three stages of how we process grief. And emancipation means there's a point in which one must free themselves from their dead loved one. And it's actually a huge relief when you free yourself of their existence in your life, because that's what's actually going on. Then you readjust. What does your new life without that person look like? And then you actually get to form a new relationship with your dead person or people. So he really split this up into kind of, like I said, three stages of how we heal. Now I wanna tell you another story about Ash Merlin Rickley. He died on November 11th, 2017 at the age of 30. He was a wild person but also a very sweet person. He was extremely talented in terms of illustration and was a multi-instrumentalist and a river runner and really a talented guy. He was mechanical. He worked as a bowling alley mechanic and would try to repair anything around the house. So. Let's see this guy in action. Hey folks, my name's Ash and I'm gonna play you an old tune called the Old Man River. Just keeps rolling, he keeps on rolling along. He don't plant taters, he don't plant cotton, and they who plant them are soon forgotten. But Old Man River just keeps on rolling along. Strain, body aching and racked with pain. Tote that barge, flip that bill, get a lit and land him in jail. I get weary and sick of trying. I'm tired of living and scared of dying. But old man river. He just keeps rolling along.
Thank you so much. Thank you, Ash. So along with this young man being talented and wonderful and was a chess player, a comic book collector, and loved Calypso music. He also happened to be the love of my life. So just wanted to show you some cute photos of us to, you know, really tug at your heartstrings here. And also to read you this poem that I would, that I, I've read a few times. I read it often on his birthday and it was the very first poem I ever sent to him after we fell in love. Even after all this time, the sun never says to the earth, you owe me. Look what happens with a love like that. It lights the whole sky. And I think that if you could summarize our relationship and the philosophy of how we treated each other, it would be in those words. So, as I said, he died November 11th, 2017, and the causes are pretty unclear, but his heart stopped working and quickly thereafter, so did his brain. But he was in the hospital for five days before we got to take him home, and he passed away underneath the ginkgo tree in our backyard. And I didn't mention this before, but I was pregnant with our twins at the time, and I was almost six months pregnant. So the kind of readjustment I needed to make was extremely massive because I had never, ever intended on raising our children without Ash. And these children are Seishada Jewel and Rio Casper, and they are now four. And we have an awesome life. We have a wonderful time. Our community is incredible. We live in a wonderful place. And it isn't, of course, without struggle, but parenthood can be really difficult, no matter how many resources you have. So how did we get here? <laughs> how did we get to living this beautiful life after such a deeply unique and intense tragedy? It's very rare for young widows to exist, much less pregnant young widows. So. I will say that there were two questions that came to my mind when Ash first went into the hospital because I really had a deep feeling that he wasn't going to make it. And when I saw him, he, he wasn't responsive and I knew it was very unlikely he was gonna recover and it seemed like he wasn't there anymore. And so one of my first questions was, where did you go? And of course, that's an extremely kind of spiritual and metaphysical, potentially religious question that we won't be covering in this talk. But the second question, how do I do this, is ultimately practical. It's corporal. It's about the lived experience how will I do this without you? And I did mean raise our kids, but I also just meant, how do I live my life? It was like I had visions of the future until I died. And part of them did include the possibility that he was going to die first, but it seemed like a different story altogether to envision that. So all of a sudden, my vision of the future was completely blank. 
And I didn't really know what to do, but there were so many people grieving at the same time and so many people who wanted to help each other. And one of the very first healing things that I did was write a shadow play with Ash's brother, Eli, called Merlin Murden Returns to the Scene. And we wrote this shadow play about Ash and specifically Ash as Merlin the Magician. And in this shadow play, Merlin is hanging out with King Arthur, right? Because they're both from the Arthurian legends and the fairies steal a song of Arthur's and it's the song of all songs. And Arthur is like, Merlin, how do I get this back? I don't know what to do. And Merlin's like, oh, okay, well, I'll turn you into a dog and you can go steal it back from the fairies. And so he does, but then of course, Arthur kind of bungles the whole thing and Merlin has to go get the song anyway. And they're standing by the edge of the sea and Arthur's like, wait, you got the song? And Merlin's like, yeah, 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 you know. I, I knew you were gonna bungle this up. So I just went and got it myself. And then he says, okay, well, I'm gonna go back to the sea now. And Arthur's like, what am I gonna do without you? Wait, you're going forever? And Merlin's like, yep, I got the song of all songs and now I'm, I'm heading on. And you know, Arthur's kind of staying there and watches Merlin disappear into the ocean. And then he looks down and realizes, Merlin never turned me back into a human. I'm still a dog. And the play ends. And it's really a, you know, entertaining, cool shadow play. And we actually performed it on December 3rd at Ash's Celebration of Life. And that whole service was so incredible. I'd never seen anything like it before. Uh, many people performed and sang and spoke about Ash. And at the very end, very spontaneously, we all stood up and gave Ash a standing ovation. So there was nobody on the stage, but we all clapped because this guy did it. He led a life and it was short, but it was amazing. And we honored that. And it was a community healing experience that was absolutely incredible. But of course there was, you know, the next thing to do, which was to have my children and then figure out how I was going to take care of twin babies. So, what we did as a community was make a schedule, make lists. I had someone with me every single night. There was a rotation of characters, many of whom are depicted in this image. So Ash died right before Thanksgiving of 2017. And the pictures from that Thanksgiving are not worth sharing because I felt completely disembodied while being pregnant, which was extremely strange. But then the next Thanksgiving after, you know, we had almost a year under our belts, the twins were born on February 2nd of 2018, of raising these two beautiful children as a community, this Thanksgiving was incredible. It was wonderful. We'd all been together, working hard, taking care of Rio and Seixada. And it felt like one, okay, it's gonna be okay. But two, that maybe we were all growing a bit after this major loss of someone that we so deeply loved. All right, another story. So why am I showing you this picture of 
Ben Stiller uh, playing his, you know, very critical role as Derek Zoolander in the movie Zoolander. And while it is comical to look at Zoolander's blue steel, it's also because Ben Stiller is incredibly successful. If you think about someone of his ilk in terms of acting, writing, directing, he's got it all on top of a, you know, had a beautiful life growing up, um, married Christine Taylor, his love and had kids and they have this wonderful, you know, marriage and home life and wealthy and success. So they, they did the thing, they have it all. And then something happened. Actually, many things happened starting in 2014. Within six years, Ben Stiller was diagnosed with cancer. His movie fails, Zoolander 2. His mom dies. He goes through an extremely public divorce with Christine. His dad dies. And then the pandemic hits. So a lot, <laughs> a lot of stuff happened in a very short amount of time. And what did he do? How did he handle this? Well, he shifted and showed his flexibility in his artistry really and wrote an extremely successful show, Severance. And of course, I'm sorry, he, he wrote, he co-wrote it, but he created the show and directs the show, Severance. And he, is known typically for comedy, right? So many comedians who try to shift to more serious or dramas or some other genre get pretty slammed uh, by journalists and media reviewers. Um, most people don't really make that shift successfully, but Ben Stiller, you know, he hit it out of the ballpark. And this severance is a, sci-fi thriller show and you know he has talked about how his his grief kind of propelled him to do this thing he had, at this point has nothing to lose and granted he doesn't have anything to lose also because he was wildly successful previously but it's not really about that for him. I don't think it's because he feels comfortable. In fact, I think it was because he felt uncomfortable and he was like, well, I can just grow now. That's what I can do next and just keep doing that. So what is it that helps us heal? What did Ben Stiller do? What did I do? What did my community do? What do people do? How do we heal? What did the patients of Eric Lindemann do? And the first thing we talk about often is this idea of resilience. And I'll get into this a little bit more in a minute, but it's not really just about resilience strength. People would say to me, you're so strong. I can't believe you can handle this. If anyone can handle this extreme tragedy, it's you because you're so strong. But it's not just strength either. Resources. I had a community, Ben Stiller had money and family support. And, you know, people have doctors and there's all sorts of things, medication, um, access. And yes, those things are all critical, but in fact, it might really be more about this idea of flexibility, the ability to shift, to change your behavior when the environment changes, to make 
decisions that allow you to thrive in a new situation. All right, let's go to the brain stuff here first. So this idea of cognitive flexibility is, you know, there's all sorts of pathways, of course, involved in being flexible, but I want to focus on these two. So the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is involved in working memory, and then the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, which is really involved in making good choices. So this idea of a combination of working memory and decision-making being sort of at the forefront of how we are cognitively flexible. So again, you know, you do hear cognitive flexibility, flexibility and creativity, um, behavioral flexibility, but again, it's really just about you know, changing whatever behavior you're talking about to fit the new situation. How easily can you do that? And how well can you do that? So folks from creativity research have also said that actively experiencing diversifying events enhances creativity due to improved flexibility. So I thought about this a lot because on one hand, flexibility allows you to handle things coming at you um, in sort of a better way, right? So you're making better choices your understanding the situation better uh, if you are flexible, but how do you get flexible? And they're saying, well, diversifying events probably, you know, help you be more flexible. And then when we're talking about creativity here, a lot of it's just about decision making and response response to your environment. So that there's also a learning component there. So I almost thought of this in kind of like an Ouroboros way where you're, you know, the thing that is helping you to improve is also, you know, the thing that will continue to happen and you'll respond to that. So, you know, it's, it's a back and forth. It's an interplay, really, right? So, probably the most prolific and well-known contemporary grief researcher is George Bonanno. And he wrote a book called The Other Side of Sadness. And his ideas about how we grieve were, I mean, really controversial when they first came out because he, he talked about resilience and he actually said, you know, maybe even some of the things that we do in grief work and grief healing, um, especially from a clinical lens might, might not really help us heal. And Maybe what we need to be doing is, you know, working on our growth and working on what he calls regulatory flexibility. And before I tell you what that is, so the controversy really comes from the fact that <clears throat> people felt like maybe he was dismissing, you know, therapy, the need for therapy. And he was saying, well, it's not that people don't ever need therapy, but to sort of set grief as this thing that's not human almost, or that's like a pathology itself really might not be helpful. And then the other side of the controversy was, this is so obvious. <coughs> of course, resilience is involved in healing but people really hadn't said that much. 
at all, and certainly not in the way he did and thoroughly investigated it. So Bonanno and Burton published kind of a, a bit of a theoretical paper in 2013 looking at regulatory flexibility. And he, you know, typically focuses on how the individual handles stressful events in life. And basically, it's all about context and what really works in terms of the strategies we choose. So again, this idea of flexibility, of moving through life, of bending, of reassessing our situations regularly, not just having this set plan and thinking you follow that out. You don't pre-write the story of your life. You are writing it and living it all at the same time. So it does make me think that maybe if we continue to engage in tasks that require flexibility, we'll continue to help heal our grief. And these are things that actually don't have anything to do necessarily with the situation. So for example, with Ashine, it wasn't that I needed to keep thinking of Ash dying over and over again in a way that was, you know, new or something like thinking about it in new ways. And even though I did a little of that, these other things were actually really helpful. So for one, doing things that you know how to do, but doing them differently, even just driving a different way to a friend's house or to work, you know, and I find myself doing that just because I maybe want to see something I haven't in a while, some tree or, you know, kind of a layout of a, of the city that I'd like to, to see. So, you know, again, doing something that there is one best way pretty much, and it might change a bit depending on time, but just doing something a little differently going to a new place. Uh, there's a part of my yard that I, you know, don't go to very much, but when I go there and sit and just see new things, it makes me think about, you know, scenes in that part of my yard that I would have never imagined if I wasn't sitting in it. Learning new skills, obviously, this is probably the most obvious one. Um, particularly ones that involve problem solving. Being with your community. That's the one that I think was really special about what we did. Um, and I feel like focusing on, you know, the people around you and weaving the story together as one is actually really, really flexible because then you're also ending up in conversations that are really difficult where you have to be extremely honest with yourself and considering things from so many perspectives. So it just kind of it flexes you naturally to do this when you're healing. And this one should have been flip-flop there, but also practicing mindfulness meditation, which kind of goes along with what I was saying about being with your community and that you actually have to show up in an ultimately honest way. So being present with yourself and with your real thoughts is critical and it also makes you really flexible because you're seeing clearly and that's something that you do have to practice and a really good way to do that is through mindfulness meditation 
All right. Well, I wanted to thank everyone who came to witness this talk and hopefully stay for some Q&A afterwards, um, who listened to my story and ideas about grief and particularly ideas about how flexibility helps us heal and specifically how flexibility within your community is a really critical way to grow through grief. And thank you to Dr. Anna Abraham and everyone at the UGA Torrance Center who's worked to host the 2022 Festival of Ideas. Thank you so much.